أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode we digressed a bit <coughs> to speak about the incident of the satanic verses, the fictitious story uh, called the incident of the satanic verses. And we spoke about that in the context of the, the Muslims return from Abyssinia. And we concluded that, that this story was likely fabricated to justify why the mushrikeen prostrated when the Prophet ﷺ recited Surat and najm They were so overwhelmed by the, the eloquence of the Qur'an that they, <clears throat> they simultaneously, they almost involuntarily prostrated. And in order to explain you know, why they prostrated when the Qur'an was recited, it seems that they made up the story that the Prophet ﷺ praised and recognized their idols. And this is perhaps what led to the, the rumor, the confusion that the leaders of the pagans had converted to Islam. Because they prostrated uh, when they heard the recitation of Surat al najm it seems that a rumor spread that the that the pagans, the leaders of the pagans had embraced Islam and this encouraged uh, some of the Muslims to return from Abyssinia and settle back in Mecca. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, not only did he send his followers to Abyssinia because he felt that it was a safe refuge for them, but in addition to that, we see that the Prophet ﷺ actually invites Najashi himself to Islam. There, there's correspondence, there are letters that are exchanged between the Prophet ﷺ and Najashi. And in fact, the Prophet sends an envoy to Najashi to invite him to Islam. And historians mention that the Prophet sent a man one of his companions by the name of Amr ibn Umayyah al damri The Prophet dispatches him to Abyssinia. When he arrives, of course, they exchange uh, pleasantries. And Amr essentially says to Najashi that I must speak. You know, the Prophet has sent me with the message and you must listen. Accept Islam and you will have, you will have attained all good and virtue. You know, notice the Prophet ﷺ, you know, doesn't mince words. He's very direct, very assertive. He says, accept Islam and you will have attained all good and virtue. If you do not, then you have behaved with this Prophet as the Jews behaved with Jesus, son of Mary. So Am again, you know, puts this message in his own words and essentially tells him that if you, after you've heard the Qur'an, if you decide to reject Muhammad as a messenger, you will have fallen, followed this in, in the footsteps of the Jews with respect to their attitude towards Jesus, the son of Mary. Now, Najashi was actually quite receptive. If you recall, he was moved to tears when he heard Ja'far, uh, Ibn Abi Talib recite those verses from Surat Maryam. So Najashi, when he when he meets the Prophet's envoy, and he is asked, he's requested by the Prophet, he's invited to Islam. The Prophet uh, Najashi says, "I testify that he, that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, is the Prophet awaited by Ahl al-Kitab." He is the prophet that is awaited by the people of the book. And that the prophecy of Moses, 
concerning the one who will ride a donkey, the one who will ride a donkey, meaning Jesus, is like the prophecy of Jesus concerning the one who will ride a camel. So according to Najashi, Musa foretold the, he gave the glad tidings of the coming of Jesus. And similarly, Jesus gave glad tidings of a future prophet who will ride a camel, who will emerge from the Arab lands. Najashi continues saying, I know nothing is like seeing him, meaning seeing him with my own eyes, but my supporters in Abyssinia are few. Give me some time so I can gather more supporters and soften their hearts. If I can, I will come to him. So it seems that from this interaction, Najashi believed in the Prophet. He had embraced Islam, but he was apprehensive about publicizing it. He had a few supporters, and it seems that his plan was to gather uh, support and then join the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca. Now, of course, <clears throat> as we saw uh, in our previous episodes, when Najashi meets, especially Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, and he hears the recitation of the Qur'an, you know, this was done in a public space. People saw that Najashi was very sympathetic towards Islam and the Muslims. He was moved to tears, and he actually affirmed that Jesus is a servant of God. So people in Abyssinia, they start to accuse Najashi of betraying his faith. And they consider his statement that Jesus is a slave of God, is a servant of God, they thought that this was blasphemous. You know, from a, from a Christian perspective, many of the, the Abyssinians consider it to be blasphemous that Najashi would call Jesus a servant of God. Now, <clears throat> Najashi was very concerned about the, the protection and the safety of the Muslims. And he, was, he had his own plans about how to spread the, this, the message of the Prophet. But he was worried about the Muslims. So Najashi puts the Muslims on boats and he sends them off. Especially when, when things became very unstable in Abyssinia. He sends them off telling them, if I am ousted, go wherever you can. And if I win, then you may stay. So this shows you that there were certain periods in Abyssinia <clears throat> where Najashi felt that it may no longer be safe for the Muslims to remain. Najashi anticipates that there is going to be a public hearing. There's going to be a public hearing regarding his faith and whether he has become a heretic. <clears throat> so Najashi writes on a piece of paper. And what he writes is that, you know, I testify that there is no God but Allah. And I testify that Muhammad is his abd, he is his servant and messenger. And I testify that Jesus, son of Mary, is the servant of God and his messenger and a spirit created by him and his word. And these are all uh, expressions that are found in the Qur'an. And he is his word which he cast into the Virgin Mary. So he writes this elaborate declaration of faith. And he puts it in his breast pocket near his heart. <clears throat> now why does he do this? We'll see why he does this. He entered into the public court, and you can, you can imagine, Najashi is the ruler of Abyssinia, but the people are now t taking him to trial because they, they're accusing him of blasphemy. So he enters the court, and of course, being the ruler, he addresses the masses. And he says to them, O people of Abyssinia, 
Am I not the most worthy ruler for you? They replied that he was. Of course, he was a man who was known for his justice. He, he was so renowned for his fairness that even the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, you know, recognized that this is a man in whose, in whose land no one is wronged. He then asks, how, was, how has my character been? They replied, the people replied that, you know, you have the best character. You are a, a great ruler. You have the skill set to manage, to govern, and you're, an, you're a man of integrity. So then he asked, what is the issue? What is your problem with me? If I, am, if I have the ability to govern, and I am a person of integrity and nobility, what is your issue with me? So they said, that you have abandoned our religion and you believe now that you say that Jesus is a servant. So he asked the people, what do you say about Jesus? What is your belief regarding Isa alayhi salam? So in a resounding, in a, in, a, in a unified voice, the people say that he is the son of God. Najashi, and this, this is why he placed that written note in his breast pocket. Najashi, he placed his hand over his breast pocket and said, I testify that Jesus, son of Mary, is nothing more than this. Now the people thought that he was affirming that Jesus is the son of God, but in fact what he meant, you know, just so... He doesn't speak what he believes to be uh, blasphemous. He was referring to the message, the written shahada that he, that he had placed in his pocket. So he does a sort of taqiyya or a sort of tawriya where he says something that is true, but it, it's, it's understood in a different light uh, by his audience. And he does this, of course, uh, to protect himself. So with this statement, he satisfies the people, and he also affirms his own faith at the same time. Now, of course, <clears throat> so this is the story of Najashi's uh, conversion to Islam. And when you study the, the biography of the Prophet, you see that during the lifetime of the Prophet, there are two Najashis. One of them embraces Islam, and one of them uh, rejects the, the message of the Prophet. So it seems that this was the first Najashi, and then the one who uh, refuses to embrace Islam is the Najashi, is the ruler of Abyssinia, who receives a letter from the Prophet in the ninth year after the, the Hijrah. So this is the Najashi that embraces Islam, and it seems that this is the Najashi whom when he dies, the Prophet ﷺ, from a distance, he, uh, he recites a dua uh, when he receives news that uh, Najashi has uh, passed away. So the Prophet actually prays over him. Now, <clears throat> this brings us now to another important event during the Meccan period, during the middle of the Meccan period, and that is the formal conversion of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. And this took place approximately in the sixth year after the Hijrah. You know, there are a number of events that take place in the fifth, in the sixth year after the Hijrah that require independent episodes. For instance, inshallah, perhaps in our next episode, we'll speak a little bit about the birth of Lady Fatima al Zahra, السلام, which took place in the fifth year after the Bi'tha. But for now, we'll speak about uh, two uh, important events uh, that took place shortly after the, the, the second migration to Abyssinia. So the first is the, the formal conversion of Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib. Now, as many of you know, Hamza is the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And he was a well-known archer. He was one of the strongest men in Mecca in terms of his 
physical strength. You know, he's what we would call an alpha male, a man's man. He enjoyed hunting. He would often go on long hunting expeditions. And he had his own ritual where he would go and hunt. And after returning from a hunting expedition, he would go to the Kaaba, he would perform tawaf, and he would go home. Now, keep in mind that many Shi'i scholars believe that he embraced Islam long before the sixth year after the Ba'tha. Some say that he believed uh, very early on. Uh, he was invited by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa in, uh, in Da'wat uh, Dhul Ashira when the Prophet in, invited his nearest of kin. It seems that he probably embraced Islam at that time, but for whatever reason, uh, he felt that it would be better for him to conceal his faith. That's also a possibility. But in any case, the story of his formal conversion goes as follows. Now, as you know, as we've discussed in our previous episodes, Abu Jahan emerges as the Prophet's arch nemesis. He is one of the Prophet's most staunch enemies, even more so, I would say, than, uh, than Abu Sufyan. Abu Jahl went out of his way to torment the Prophet and his followers. Now, Abu Jahl, of course, on one occasion, you know, he, he had a habit of ridiculing and, you know, insulting the Prophet, but on one occasion, he was so verbally abusive to the Prophet that even by his own standards, he went overboard. And he ridicules, he mocks the Prophet to such an extent that he even starts to curse the Prophet's ancestors. And he does this publicly. You know, he, he tries to publicly humiliate the Prophet. Now, of course, the Prophet belongs to the, the clan of Bani Hashim. And some of the women of Bani Hashim were quite offended by the actions of Abu Jahl. And they go to Hamza and they say to him that Abu Jahl has today, he publicly ridiculed your nephew and he cursed and mocked our tribe, our clan, our ancestors. So, Hamza had just returned from a hunting expedition and he was just fed up with Abu Jahl and his antics. And after hearing that, you know, he had deeply insulted the Prophet ﷺ, Hamza goes straight to Abu Jahl and without even exchanging words, he took his, his bow, you know, he, he was carrying a, a bow and arrow because he had just come back from hunting, he takes his bow and he basically strikes Abu Jahl on his face and basically knocks him out. And blood gushes from the face of Abu Jahl. And, you know, people were completely shocked. You know, Hamza strikes him down with a single blow and Hamza looks at Abu Jahl and says to him and to everyone who's watching that Muhammad is not only my nephew, but I am also a follower of his religion. And basically, I dare anyone to cause him harm. Hamza sent a very clear message to anyone that if you ridicule, if you strike the Prophet, you're going to have to deal with me. And of course, Hamza being, you know, the warrior that he was, you know, people, you know, feared uh, getting into any altercation with him. So this is a little bit about the, the conversion of Hamza. And definitely the Muslims felt, uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ was overjoyed. And the Muslims definitely felt that their their ranks had been strengthened with the conversion of Hamza. Now we come to another event that's often cited in the early history of Islam 
particularly in the sixth year after the Ba'tha. And when you study the, the Sunni narrative of the, the Seerah, especially the Meccan period, you'll often see an entire section or an entire chapter dedicated to the conversion story of Umar ibn al-Khattab. The conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab in the Sunni tradition is considered to be a major turning point in the early history of Islam. Why? Because his conversion is seen, is un, it's seen to be an event that strengthens Islam and intimidates the, the pagans. You know, like Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib, Umar ibn al-Khattab in Sunni Islam is portrayed as a physically powerful person, a man with massive influence, a man who's, who, who would put the fear of God in people. And no one wanted to get into any physical altercations with Umar. This is how he's portrayed in the Sunni tradition as this ferocious warrior, this brute, a man of incredible strength. Now, now Umar was definitely, you know, before his conversion, was seen as one of the enemies of Islam. In fact, some historians mention that Umar's hatred of Islam and his hostility to the Prophet were matched only by the hatred and hostility to, to them of his own maternal uncle. Now, Abu Jahl was the maternal uncle of Umar. Now, this is how he's presented. However, we'll speak about why, why this is unlikely, why this is doubtful. Now, we know Abu Jahl has a well-established track record of tormenting Muslims, both physically and verbally. Now, to say that Umar ibn al-Khattab was like Abu Jahl, in his hostility to the early Muslims is doubtful, and I'll mention why. So according to the, the Sunni tradition, it is said that one day, and, and this some Shia scholars may also accept this, this uh, story, it is said that one day, so this is the, the conversion story of Umar ibn al-Khattab, it said, that one day, out of sheer frustration, you know, Omar, it seems that he was just fed up with the Prophet. And he decided one day that he just wanted to put an end to Islam. And he resolved to kill the Prophet. And of course, by killing the Prophet, you are extinguishing the flame of Islam. That if you want to crush a movement, eliminate its leader. So the story goes that he leaves his home with the intention of killing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Where does he go? He goes to Darul Arqam. Darul Arqam, as we mentioned, it was the, the meeting place of the Muslims in Mecca. It was Initially it was a secret meeting place before the, the da'wah became public. But it became a place where Muslims would come together and congregate, they would meet, they would talk. On his way to Darul Arqam, he meets a man by the name of Nu'aym ibn Abdullah. Now, Nu'aym sees that Umar is, is angry and he's, he, his eyes are, you know, he looks infuriated. He looks like he's about to do something, you know, irrational. So Nu'aym says, what are you doing? Where are you going? Umar says, I'm going to kill Muhammad. Nu'aym says to him that, Oh Umar, have you, have you lost your mind? Do you think that Bani Hashim, that the children of Abd Manaf, you think they're going to just let you, up, you they're just going to let you kill their, their son? You know, Muhammad is protected, he's guarded by his followers. You think it's just going to be that easy for you to walk walk in and, and, and kill the Prophet. And Nu'aym informs him that, you know, before you would go to the Prophet, you know, by the way, your sister is a Muslim. 
Now, Umar was not aware that his sister and his brother-in-law had converted to Islam. His sister, her name was Fatima. Fatima, uh, uh, the daughter of uh, Khattab. Fatima bint al-Khattab. So when he learns that his own sister had converted to Islam and she was a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he completely lost it. And he changes his direction. Initially, he was planning on going to Darul Arqam to assassinate the Prophet, to kill the Prophet with his own hands. He changed his direction and he headed to the house of his own sister to, to see, is this a rumor or is it true that my sister had converted? So Umar arrives at the, at the door at the residence of his sister and he enters and he sees Khabab, Khabab ibn al-Arat, Khabab, the famous companion of the Prophet. And he sees that Khabab is teaching Umar's sister and her husband Surah Taha. When he sees this, he explodes and he actually strikes his own sister. And he hit her so hard, according to this narration, that her blood, the blood from her face started to gush. And he was about to strike her again, but the sight of blood covering the face of his sister made him pause. And it seemed that he was no longer going to attack her. And... When his sister saw that he had calmed down, she showed him, he wanted to see what they were reading. Umar's sister says that, you know, you're a mushrik, you cannot touch uh, the Qur'an. So in any case, to make a long story short, he ends up reading the text of the Qur'an. And after reading the text of the Qur'an, he decides to accept Islam. Uh, he at the age of 35. So he recites his shahada and historians, they place the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab to Islam in the sixth year after the Ba'tha, the sixth year after the commencement of the prophetic mission. Now, there is a narration mentioned in uh, At-Tirmidhi, Jami' At-Tirmidhi, and this is one of the, the six books, one of the Sihah. A Tirmidhi reports. So we know, we know the, the six you know, authentic books of hadith in the Sunni tradition. A Tirmidhi is one of them. He reports a narration from Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar is the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He reports Anna Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi that the Prophet once made a dua. And this was before the conversion of Umar. What was the dua of the Prophet? Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi-ahab hadayn al-rajulayn ilayk bi-abi jahlin aw bi-Umar ibn al-Khattab. The Prophet raised his hands in dua and said, Oh Allah, honor Islam, strengthen Islam, through the most dear, the most beloved to you among these two men, through Abu Jahl or through Umar ibn al-Khattab. So this narration basically places Abu Jahl next to Umar ibn al-Khattab because of course Abu Jahl was a very, you know, there's no doubt that Abu Jahl was a very influential person. And if Abu Jahl converts to Islam, because of his influence, many people would, would join Islam. It seems that this narration is trying to place Umar ibn al-Khattab at the same social status of Abu Jahl. To imply that if Umar ibn al-Khattab becomes Muslim, people will join Islam in, drones, in droves because of his influence and the Muslims will feel relieved that such a powerful person who was tormenting the Muslims is now one of us. 
So the Prophet makes this dua, allegedly makes this dua, saying that, Oh Allah, strengthen Islam through the most dear of these two men, Abu Jahl or Umar. قَالَ وَكَانَ أَحَبَّهُمَا إِلَيْهِ عُمَرٌ And the, more, the one who is more dear to Allah is, was Umar because he was the one who ended up converting uh, between the two men. Now, these reports, now let's take a moment, put our emotions aside. Let's approach this conversion story with some logic. These reports... When you look, when you read the conversion story of Umar ibn al-Khattab, when you read this dua that the Prophet made, allegedly made, that's mentioned by Tirmidhi, reported by the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, you see that Umar ibn al-Khattab is portrayed as a fearless man who was so courageous, so bold, that even if the Prophet has people like Abu Talib, people like Hamza who are protecting him, even people like Ali ibn Abi Talib, all of these personalities, that he was so fearless, so courageous, that despite all of that, he was willing to kill the Prophet with his own hands. Now, the problem with this is that if Umar ibn al-Khattab was so courageous and so fearless, why do we not see any signs of this bravery and courage and fearlessness in any of the battles of Islam? In the battle of Badr, we don't have any reports of Umar ibn al-Khattab's battle time heroics. In the battle of Uhud, in the battle of Uhud, we know that Umar ibn al-Khattab retreated. Again, again, we're not saying this to offend anybody, but that's the reality. That's, these are the facts on the ground. In none of the battles of Islam can we say that, you know, Umar ibn al-Khattab carried the Muslim army. And it's because of him that the, there are no signs of courage and bravery in any of the battles of Islam. So how is it that this person who is portrayed and who is depicted as this fearless warrior, why is it that we don't see any consistency in this narrative after his conversion to Islam. And did the situation for Muslims improve or get worse after Umar's conversion? Now, so if we say that, you know, Umar ibn al-Khattab, so if we go back to this dua, and again, this dua is likely fabricated. If we go back to this dua, the Prophet allegedly is saying, Oh Allah, strengthen Islam through either Abu Jahl or through Umar. And strengthen him through the one who is most dear to you among these two. Now Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl, we, it's very well documented that he would, he would beat up Muslims. He would physically abuse them. He was a man who hailed from a very well-known tribe. The tribe of Makhzum. He was very, he had a very high social status, a man of great influence. He was known to be physically strong too. Umar ibn al-Khattab, after his conversion to Islam, we don't see any, any signs of courage or bravery. Furthermore, Umar ibn al-Khattab doesn't come from a tribe that's as influential as the tribe of Abu Jahl. He comes from uh, Banu Adi, which is a very, it's an average or even a below average tribe. He doesn't come from a prestigious tribe for the Prophet to say that, oh, if Umar, if, if, if Abu Jahl or if Umar converts to Islam, Islam will be strengthened. So if Umar ibn al-Khattab is this courageous, fearless, powerful, influential personality, and when he converted to Islam, Islam was strengthened, the question is, how was Islam strengthened by the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab? Did the situation for Muslims improve 
or get worse after Umar's conversion. So let's look at the timeline here. The Muslims are, they were being abused, they were being persecuted, and the Prophet sends some of his followers to Abyssinia. The Muslims that remain in Mecca, especially those who had the backing of tribes, they remained in Mecca. Umar converts in the year 6 after the Bi'th. What happened after that? Did the did Quraysh stop persecuting Muslims? In fact, the situation got even worse. We see that after the sixth year after the, the Bi'tha, after the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab, what changed? What improved? The Muslims were boycotted. They were economically, socially boycotted. They had to stay in the cave hideouts the mountain hideout of the Shi'ab of Abi Talib. So the Muslims suffered much more. So in what way did the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab improve the condition for the early Muslims? Some say after the conversion of Umar, Muslims were, were able to practice their religion publicly. We know that from the seerah, the Prophet ﷺ, he publicized the, his, his mission, his message, before the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab, not after. Also, when we go to some narrations mentioned in Bukhari, we see that there is a contradiction, there is an inconsistency between... The, narr the narrative that Umar is this courageous, fearless man, and what we find in these narrations. So, so keep in mind this, this narrative, this portrayal of Umar as this courageous, brave, new convert to Islam. This narration is from Bukhari, and it's also narrated by uh, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah ibn Umar. He says, لَمَّا أَسْلَمَ عُمَرْ اجْتَمَعَ النَّاسُ عِنْدَ دَارِ When Umar embraced Islam, the disbelievers, the mushrikeen, they gathered around his home. وَقَالُوا صَبَى عُمَرْ They said that Umar has embraced Islam. وَأَنَا غُلَامٌ فَوْقَ ظَهْرِ بَيْتِي Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he says that at that, at that time, I was still a boy and I was on the roof of my house. So Umar is inside of his house. People are surrounding his house. فَجَاءَ رَجُلٌ عَلَيْهِ قَبَاءٌ مِنْ دِيبَاجْ فَقَالَ قَدْ صَبَى عُمَرْ Then a man came wearing a cloak of silk, a silk cloak, and said, Umar has embraced Islam. فَمَا ذَاكَ فَأَنَا لَهُ جَارْ قَالَ فَرَأَيْتُ النَّاسَ تَصَدَّعُوا عَنْ فَقُلْتُ مَنْ هَذَا قَالُوا الْعَاصِ إِبْنُ وَائِلِ So the narration is saying that Umar was basically in his house and people were surrounding his house. So Umar it seems, and we'll look at another narration to confirm this, Umar was afraid to go outside because people were surrounding his house. The mushrikeen had surrounded his house. They were declaring that Umar has converted to Islam. The son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah, who was on the roof, he says that there, there, a man came wearing a, a, a silk robe, a cloak, and he confirmed to the people that yes, Umar ibn al-Khattab has converted, but nobody can harm him, for I am his protector. Then Abdullah ibn Umar says, I then saw the people going away from Umar, and I asked who the man was, and they said, Al-As ibn Wa'il. So if Umar ibn al-Khattab is so brave, if he's so courageous, if he's so fearless, why is he afraid to come out of his house? Why is it that it takes someone like Al-As ibn Wa'il to say to the people that, He's under my protection. You're not allowed to harm him. So the people were intending on harming him. And Umar ibn al-Khattab did not want to leave his house. 
In another narration in Sahih al-Bukhari, again, what I want to bring to your attention is there is an inconsistency here. Who is the real Umar ibn al-Khattab? Is it the fearless man, the courageous man, the bold man who is not afraid, who was willing to kill the Prophet with his bare hands? Or is it this individual who was afraid? And this, what we see in this narration is more consistent with what we see from this individual after his conversion to Islam. Someone who doesn't really do much in the battlefields. He's not like Ali ibn Abi Talib where he's on the front lines and you know he kills half of the, the casualties in the battle of, uh, of Badr. That's not what we see here. So I'll just read the, the English for the sake of time. So Abdullah ibn Umar again, he says, while Umar was at home in a state of fear. So again, these are not my words. These are the words of the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab. قَالَ بَيْنَمَا هُوَ فِي الدَّارِ خَائِفًا Umar, after converting to Islam, he was inside of his house in a state of fear. إِذْ جَاءَهُ الْعَاصُ بْنُ وَائِلْ السَّهْمِ And then, Al-Asu bin Wa'il al-Sahmi, he came wearing an embroidered cloak and a shirt having silk hems. He was from the tribe of Bani Sahim, who were our allies during the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. So uh, the tribe of uh, Al-Asu bin Wa'il and the tribe of Umar ibn al-Khattab, they were allies during the time of Jahiliyyah. Al-As said to Umar, what is wrong with you? What's the matter? Umar says, he says, زَعَمَ قَوْمُكَ أَنَّهُمْ سَيَقْتُلُونِي إِنْ أَسْلَمْتِ He said, your people claim that they would kill me if I become a Muslim. قَالَ لَا سَبِيلَ إِلَيْكِ Al-As says what? Nobody will harm you after I have given protection to you. So Al-As went out and met the people streaming in the whole valley and he said, where are you going? They said, we went, we want, what do you want? They say that we, we want Umar ibn al-Khattab. He embraced Islam. Al-As says to the people who have, who have come to harm Umar, to kill him, he says to them, there is no way for anybody to touch him. So the people retreated. So the people retreated. And furthermore, what we see even later on, in the sixth year after the Hijrah, so when you look at the battles of Islam, we don't see any heroics in the battlefield. We don't even have the names of people that Umar ibn al-Khattab killed in the battlefield. Who did he kill in any of the battles of Islam? Who did Abu Bakr kill in any of the battles of Islam? This is what we argue as Ithna Ashari Muslims. What were their contributions in the battlefields? Ali ibn Abi Talib, this is clear. But if you're going to argue that these were fearless warriors, give me evidence of their heroics in the battlefield. In the sixth year after the Hijrah, you know, the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, the Prophet wanted to send Umar ibn al-Khattab to negotiate. To negotiate some, the terms and the conditions of the treaty. To meet with them, to meet with the Quraysh. Umar ibn al-Khattab was afraid to go and meet. Because he, didn't, he felt that he didn't have any protection. So the, the, the question here is that why was he afraid? If he goes and he comes back and he's unhurt, then alhamdulillah. And if, let's say that he goes and he gets killed, okay, you're a shaheed. It's a win-win situation. So what are you afraid of? You know, so you, you take this and you compare it to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And we'll speak about well, you know, what Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said on the night of the Hijrah. When the Prophet says to him that I want you to sleep in my bed. You know, because Quraysh, they want to kill me. Ali ibn Abi Talib's first question is, Ya Rasulullah, if I sleep in your bed, will you be safe? Ali ibn Abi Talib is never concerned about 
What's going to happen to him? He never, he never feared for his own life. He was always afraid for the life of the Prophet So with that, inshallah, we'll conclude our conversation on the conversion story of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And inshallah, in the coming episodes, we'll speak about a couple of more events that took place during the middle of the Meccan period. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. The conversion story is not generally accepted by uh, Shia scholars. I mean, what, what's the earliest? Is there a correspondence story that uh, we have? It seems that what is, what is more consistent with, with the personality type of Umar ibn al Khattab is that. He, of course, he had animosity towards the Prophet, you know, before his uh, conversion. You know, he, he was known as an enemy of the Prophet, an enemy of the Muslims. Uh, how I, I doubt the story about him wanting to kill the Prophet. I don't think that uh, it just doesn't fit with what we see from the narrations about uh, how he, you know, his 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 concern about his own life. I don't think that he would even dare to try to kill the Prophet knowing uh, that there may be retaliation. Uh, it seems that, you know, when you look at the biography of this individual, and again, we don't say this to offend anyone. It's, it's very well known that Shia Muslims don't hold Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab in high regard. It's, it's not a, a state secret. But just to explain why why we don't hold this individual in high regard of course in addition to what we believing the fact that you know he usurped the rights of amir al-mu'minin if you look at his life it seems that he he asserts his power over people that don't have the ability to retaliate for example his sister he strikes his sister. In the Battle of Badr, of course, he doesn't really do anything on the battlefield. He, he doesn't kill anybody that we know of. After the Battle of Badr, there were, there were war prisoners, captives. This is where you see Umar ibn al-Khattab say, kill them. So, when there are captives, when there are women when he's dealing with people who he knows cannot retaliate, this is where you see Umar ibn al-Khattab asserting his power and his strength. You don't see it with other, with other men generally. Of course, when he's the Khalifa, of course he has power, and you know he intimidated some of the companions of the Prophet. But uh, but generally, the the story of him wanting to kill the Prophet, I personally. I'm, I'm doubtful about that. Um, so it seems that what is more likely is that he heard, um, I'll, I'll mention two different uh, versions. Some scholars say that he, he discovered that his sister had converted to Islam. He strikes her. He feels sorry that he struck his sister. He reads some of the ayat of Surah Taha. He reads some of the ayat of the Quran and then he decides to embrace Islam. There are other scholars that say that, that Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Bakr had relationships. They knew some Jewish scholars. And we know that some of the scholars of Bani Israel they knew about the coming of the prophets. You know, many of them had settled in Arabia in anticipation of the appearance of the final prophet. And they knew that 
at the very least, he would succeed in terms of establishing a government. Now, some scholars, again, this is debatable, but some have said that because they knew, because, you know, Amr, they trusted the, the predictions of these Jewish scholars, they decided to join Islam as an early investment, meaning that they were hoping that we join early. So when this prophet dies, when this man dies, when Muhammad dies, we can take over and we can rule over this empire that, uh, that he has established. But again, it's, it's difficult to verify these reports beyond a reasonable doubt. But uh, the part of the conversion story of Umar ibn al-Khattab that is doubtful is, of course, the dua of the Prophet, the alleged dua of the Prophet that, oh Allah, strengthen Islam through either Abu Jahl or Umar ibn al-Khattab. I think that this is very evidently it's evident that this is a fabrication to bolster the position of Umar ibn al-Khattab and the, the depiction of Umar ibn al-Khattab as a fearless, courageous uh, personality is doubtful because when you read those other narrations from his son uh, that speak about how fearful he was to even leave his home, uh, it makes you doubt uh, the extent of his, uh, his courage. Does that make sense? I hope that was helpful. I don't know. I'm not. I, I, it's we don't really have that much information about uh, what was going on in, in Abyssinia, especially among the locals. I don't know if he was his direct successor, but there were there were definitely two Najashis, and Najashi is is basically a, a title. It's like Caesar or Pharaoh. So. There were definitely at least two Najashis that uh, that were that were contemporary to the Prophet. Now, were there more in between? I don't know. I'm not sure. But one of them converted, and the other uh, uh, rejected the invitation of the Prophet. Were there more in between? Allahu alam.